Welcome to another figure week, park surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed Alduri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CGMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just want to thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map. Starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, Post them to the community page if you want and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course and the assignments are tailored for that as adapted from my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college level course but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this and I'll see you soon. Hey guys and welcome back to another episode of Digital Artcast. Um, glad to have you all back here again for another amazing episode and this one definitely is amazing. Um, I hope you guys are staying safe during the lockdown uh, in whatever part of the world you are in uh, and of course keeping busy with projects uh, personal or professional and again thanks to a lot of the guys who joined the discord, uh, dropped questions for these episodes and of course subscribe, like and comment on the videos, it's always appreciated. Um, a couple of shout outs to some of our sponsors um, and guys we are partnered with, uh, Artwad, um, Antonio Staparitz uh, School um, has joined with us in Unity to kind of promote both sides of the coin. So uh, you guys will check out some of the links below, you'll find uh, links to Antonio's school um, and uh, that's definitely worth uh, the money. It's one of the best things you can probably pay for for an art education, Antonio is a great teacher. Um, moving on to today's episode. Um, again, I think as the podcast has grown in age, um, even starting with my first year, I was I was uh, honoured to interview some great legends of the industry, guys like Scott Robertson and others. Um, but again, we've had a great uh, kind of thing, miracle fall into our laps uh, at the last minute and uh, we've managed to get another legend on, even though he'll probably cringe for me saying cringe. stuff like that, but uh, it is true. <laughs> cringe, cringe, yes. Uh, today, uh, we have a uh, stupid artist, uh, artist in general, uh, uh, Dan Milligan on today. Uh, hi, say hi, Dan. Hey, I always want to say this. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> you, 
<laughs> you're more than welcome you're more than welcome uh and also uh as uh, a kind of thing we do often uh, around here we have a, a third guest uh someone who i think was also keen to speak to dan about his journey uh mr russell McCune, uh who is also uh, an artist creator um publisher um has done a lot of things in his time as well so um yeah it'll be good to get these minds melded together in this episode and we'll talk about uh, art in general i think it'll be a great episode so thanks for you guys for joining and listening and uh stick around to the end because i'm sure this is going to be a, a really good one so uh we'll start with the main guest dan uh for those who maybe don't know you uh of course i don't know who wouldn't at this point but uh, could you introduce yourself? Let the guys know who you are and what uh, you do. Uh, Dan Milligan, um, Canadian storyboard artist, born and raised in Toronto. I live about like just twenty minutes outside of Toronto now. Um, and uh, got into the industry. I work in in strictly games and film now, but I got into the industry through uh, through advertising. So um, so in, in art college, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the condensed version. I was I was about to be thrown out of art college in my second year for being like a crappy student. And in order to make up the credits okay. that I had missed or be thrown out, I took a storyboarding class. And um uh, and the, the yeah. proverbial light bulb went on. And um so uh, yeah, I landed a job when I was still in school at an ad agency, did tons of ad boards. That got they kind of got seen by I guess the, the commercial side of advertising, the production side. I started working with a lot of directors mm -hmm. on the actual commercial shoots. And uh, I guess that's where I started learning about film and storytelling to, you know, in an advertising sense. And that just leveraged me into, um, into games and film. So that's, that's kind of the Everything. condensed version, yeah. but I've always been, I worked for a studio for a year and a half when I first started and then I went freelance. So, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, and that's it now. Yeah. I'm just super lucky. You know, I get, I get to work on, cool projects yeah. and and meet cool people and and there, yeah there's the digest version yeah. of it. Oh, I, should, I should point out <laughs> i should point out that bit. when uh, i got a job at an ad agency for a year and a half when when i decided to leave they asked me if i wanted to stay as a as a separate entity as a sort of an autonomous um sort of business so they gave me everything my studio right and i ran my business um inside a large agency for for years which was really good because it's very social okay um had a lot of tech support yeah. it was nice to be you know right in downtown toronto in the million dollar square foot kind of mm -hmm. area so um then after a while i yeah. just I, I just wasn't doing much advertising anymore and it wasn't fiscally responsible <laughs> for them to give me you know a space and and just decided i want to come home so right. that was that but, but the advertising was good to me, okay. you know, like financially. And yeah. also I learned a lot from it, but I'm, I'm, I think commercial stuff is, is where a lot of people get their start. It seems to be quite a common link. I mean, like we'll dive into Russell's story. I mean, Russell, if you get, can maybe tell the guys a bit about yourself as well, because you have a similar kind of background, maybe not specifically artistically, but advertising commercial stuff was what kind of found company, your feet, right? worked in broadcast <clears throat> and we started off as sort of quite creative and then, the more sort of corporate it got down the line, the less I was enjoying it, really. We were making more money, but there wasn't the same sort of creativity, essentially. And I don't think we were very interested in anything creative, really, by that point. But that just happened to be my experience at the time, kind of thing. But uh, my background was art school as well. So I've always seen myself as just being an artist, yeah. getting involved with these things, and then coming back to being, putting mm -hmm. it back into my own, my own work. Yeah kind of thing and that was something i'd like to pick up on I, I watched a really good interview with you dan on was it edge control 2019 those guys that was really interesting but recently uh, yeah, you mentioned yeah. uh, some personal work and without going into like details i was quite interested in, in what you were thinking with that and in general terms you know what i mean working on something that you've developed is that, is that the case sort of thing? yeah Yeah, I've um, recently just the projects I've been working on in the last couple of years has given me um, some sort of connections and some sort of relationships that I would assume um, may give me some some leverage into, into maybe getting something made or even at least getting something looked at, right? Um, and uh, so got a couple of short stories that um, that I, I'd like to see 
sort of to mm-hmm. fruition. Now, whether that happens or not, you know, trust me, I've been in the industry a long time. I've seen many stories uh-huh. die, you know, on, on the table. But um, I, I, I felt like I was supposed to doing what we do for a living. I was supposed to at some point want to oil paint or I was supposed to want to go do a graphic uh-huh. novel. And um, those just aren't in me, right? Like, I truly like like storytelling um, in film, and um, I, I, I really like what I do. So I thought, why don't I do something along those lines? And I've I've had enough exposure to other people's sort of pitch material or how how stories are initially handled mm-hmm. in that in that sort of um, embryonic stage. That that's kind of that's kind of what I'm excited about right now. So um, I've got one story in particular. It's actually, it's actually got a little momentum. And by momentum, I mean within myself, not necessarily, mm-hmm. you know, with people who could make this thing happen. But, but um, yeah, I, th- I think I want to I wanna stick to doing something along the lines of what I do. I, I don't want to make a U-turn or uh-huh. a left turn. And, you know, I don't think so that's... that's like your strengths kind of thing? And that's so, sort of like sticking to... Uh, yeah, yeah the, sort of I, story, I, the story development is a... That kind of thing where you're. I like the, the sort of the. the, yeah. the, the I think, I think one kind of the. Of my... Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think one of my strengths is that I'm. I just really like what I do. As, as you know, people will tell you, you know, there's good and bad in the film industry or the game industry. I generally don't have a mm-hmm. bad time. I, I don't have. Like, I got a lot of pretty funny shitty horror stories but but they're just momentary right like like i i, I get to work with yeah. super fun people and everybody's nice and we're all rolling the boat in the same direction and um yeah it's kind of come to a point where you're you're kind of considered you're given a certain amount of of gravity or respect and and they allow you to bring stuff to the table and um yeah i'm yeah. i'm just always optimistic about it um, like I, I never have a bad time, you know, at least, you know, I have moments, you know, when, when things are getting a little sideways and deadlines get a bit crunchy, but, but, um, yeah, just like a lot of us, I just feel really fortunate to be able to do this. So I just want to keep doing it. What's the, what's the, what's the thing really that specifically to storyboarding is something that appealed to you? Like, why was that? Why did the light bulb go on essentially? What was it that lit Um, the fire? I'm not very patient. Right. And I'm not a good student. Right. So I don't, uh, I don't absorb information very easily. Uh, I'm a terrible reader. Okay. Um, and, uh, I cannot sit in my chair for more than 20 minutes. And that's about how long it takes you to do a storyboard <laughs> frame. Um, so <laughs> you bang out a frame, I go up, check out the fridge, go bug my wife, yell at some kids on my lawn, come back in and do another frame. But I think what I liked about it is that it's, it's you're not sweating the details there's details in storyboarding for sure but they're not what most people consider details as being really a refined drawing or with lots of physical right. detail storyboards have to be incredibly detailed because right. they inform they inform every part of production right from the story to finance and everything in between right um so i just like right. that urgency to them i like the fact that it was like doing a scene. It's just like doing a big gesture drawing, right? Like you just, you get to kind of see it all work together. And I do really enjoy the collaboration rather than the idea of just kind of sort of hunkering down by myself, you know, in, in, in a room, even though I am by myself in a room. Um, but with storyboarding, there's so much back and forth that goes on. And when you get yeah. um, those relationships with directors, it ends up just being super fun. Because it's just you and that person, or you know, maybe the producer, maybe the writer, and there's very little restraint. I mean, that's what the producers are for. The producers are to rein you in, but you're having that job where, you, where everything's on the table. You go like, "Hey, what if we do this? Wouldn't it be cool if we did that?" Yeah. And it's like being 12 years old again, reading a comic book or something, right? And then of course, the adults come in the room. They go, "You can't yeah. do that because that's too violent, or that's going to cost too much, or or whatever." So. I think just being in pre-production and when you've got that story laid out on those pages and you, and you get to start putting that together, um, it's, it's really fun. You know, we're not, you know, we storyboarders, we're not superstars. People don't know who we are. 
our, you know, our work is like a set of Ikea instructions, right? And, and mm. you know, like the, the big lament we always have is that whenever you get an art of book, right? Like a Marvel art of book, there's always 40, yeah. literally 40 iterations of a guy's belt buckle and maybe half a page of storyboards. <laughs> but the, and the storyboards is, is the whole yeah. movie, for God's sake. The storyboards is the, actually yeah. the movie, right? Only one belt buckle is going to make uh-huh. it to the yeah. movie, I'll- right? But... Well, I was going to say one 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 of my favorite one of my favorite books in the library and Russell will probably back me up on this is the the Star mm-hmm. Wars storyboard books that came out a while back and there that's a book of storyboards the whole yeah. thing, right? So, I think there is definitely love for storyboards in certain aspects. I think it's like it's like concept art. It's almost where like five years ago people didn't even know yeah. what that was until the well, artwork started think, coming out. I think what happens is that um, with storyboards because it's, again it's so intimate that people don't get to see kind of what goes on between you and the director and how you eventually arrive yeah. at something, right? Like you'll, you'll, you'll be working on a story and it's, it's just something's not right. You know, the character wouldn't do that, or maybe it's a, a, a physical restriction with the space you're working at, or the scene needs to be longer or shorter. Right. And, and because the drawings are so quick and so loose, they don't, they don't necessarily convey the amount of thought that goes behind it. Right, because there's literally hundreds or thousands of them that you have to do in order to get in order yeah. to get to the solution that you're looking for. Right, so it's it's mm-hmm. they're informational. They're not aesthetic. It's you know it's like the saying: storyboarding's mm-hmm. not about drawing. One of the things I like there, right? about... but having said that, hmm. sorry, Dan, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Sorry, hey, well, well, you mentioned uh, oh, like oh, how oh, many how many drawings that you do. One of the things I like best about like going through your work is is your thumbnails and things. So where we get to see uh, just how many thumbnails you might do, and, and chances are that's just a you know I mean a snapshot of of what you've done as well. But certainly with, with my students who are thinking of getting involved with this kind of thing, it's good for them to see uh, the quantity of thumbnail and, and how much work you can get done at that scale and things like that. And then there's all the sort of myths of how long it takes to do it and what tools you use and all, all that kind of thing and, and screen dimensions and all that kind of thing. What's your thoughts on that, Dan? I liked your your reference about uh, going through the sequence as a gesture. I liked that one. That was a good one to, to hear. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, yeah, there's always a lot of questions from young artists in any, or probably any profession, uh-huh. right? Um, and the, yeah, but I mean, you know, we all did the same thing. I did the same thing, right? And the, the questions are always really tangible, right? You know, how many can you do in a day? You know, what brush you're using, what, you know, et cetera. And as you get older, you realize that none of that really matters. But when you're young, it really matters, yeah. right? So and I, I answer all those yeah. questions. I, I, I don't begrudge them. But um, I also tell the story when I was in art college, I, I had, a, had an instructor who had a studio in Toronto. And every few years he would pick uh, three or four students from his class who had promise. He would bring them in to do a test. And eventually one of them would get this apprenticeship and and work as a junior artist. And he said he would, um, he would, he would have each one come in on a a, a given day and he would give them a storyboard to do. And he said he, he never picked the artist who did the best looking board. He always picked the artist who actually finished the storyboard. Because I get a beautiful board mm. that's half finished is, is zero. Mm-hmm. It's worth nothing, right? Um, yeah. And I remember that really resonating, right? I remember that you kind of have to put your ego aside and really focus on what storyboarding is all about, right? So on my website in certain places, mm. that's why I do put up my my kind of ideas or my iterations or my thumbnails, um, you know, rather than just really beautiful frames because you know 90 percent of the times you're not doing beautiful frames right so i want i want potential clients or i want people to see that here's my thought process this is here's how the sausage is made you know for, for lack of a better term so yeah i think i think i think that's i think it also just helps people understand what we do you know you know yeah from the standpoint yeah yeah i think well it's the same i think it's the same concept as well right a lot of people will see the almost at times the illustration, not the concept, but then there is a thought process even behind their working as well. And I think it's always important to to show your work, although you get kind of shouted out in school for not doing it because you hate doing it. But now it's such an important aspect of, of the creative process is your step, your thought process, because then it, it then syncs the rest of the production team 
and it, the route that you're following to see if you're actually following the direction. So I think that's one thing that I never learned early on was that why that's so important. But I think it is also good to tell students that that is something you should be considering. Uh, and also in the, the means of time, I think it is very relevant. I remember one time somebody talking about, you know, how long does something take you? But the person answering it maybe has 20 years of experience. So the answer they give, it's never relevant to you. Um, so if you can do, you know, 200 storyboards in an hour, it's not going to translate to somebody yeah. who's just starting, of course. Yeah, you know, I, so. I, I, like I said, I completely understand those questions. And I'm not sort of at that point where I've been doing it a long time where, you know, they should know better or, or whatever. Like I said, I, I had all those exact mm. same questions. And, they're, and they're, they're relevant, right? Because when you're first starting out, uh-huh. you don't have, you have no metric to gauge against, yeah. except what's made it worse is the internet, right? Like if I watch a guy do a speed painting yeah. at like 50 per, or 200% speed it up, and it's, it's gut-wrenching oh, yeah. <laughs> and just disheartening, right? Yeah. Um, you get a very uh, unrealistic view by, you know, perusing whatever art sites you, you want to get because it's the best of the best. It's everybody's mm-hmm. nicest mm-hmm. stuff and, and, um, and it's curated and edited. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of ugliness that goes on when I work. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and, uh, like I said, I, I, I try to conclude a little bit on there. Like I said, I don't want, I don't want anybody to think that, you know, every frame I do is, is, is a piece of art. I try. Right. And having said everything yeah. I just said, I think that if you want to sort of, you know, if, at the end of the day, you want to deliver the best product you can. Right. So the foundations and all the mechanical yeah. things behind a storyboard, what they need from it. But then if you can put emotion into it, right. If you can, if you can, if you can now start to tell that story, um, that just puts you up the ladder and that gets everybody excited. Right. Like I've done boards where I've handed them off and director and the producer go, Holy shit, this is going to be great. Cause they, this is the first time they're seeing the movie. Right. And, and like mm-hmm. I said, if, if you yeah. can, if you can get your drawing skills to where you can start to make them look cinematic or start to feel like it's mm-hmm. the movie rather than the, the proverbial stick figure kind of stuff that's all fine. It still works. Right. Like I, I want, I want, I want to mm-hmm. motivate people, um, logically, you know, like, you know, what, what, what do we really need, need to do in production? And I want to, I want to motivate them emotionally. I want, I want everybody to, to get jazzed on the story we're working on. Um, so yeah, there's, there's tons of room for really good drawing and, and fun and fun stuff, but it's not paramount. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something, uh, I'll get, I'll get Russ in after this question, but I'm just quite curious with, you know, you talk about getting to a level where you make stuff cinematic. I, I suppose the question is how do you get it to look cinematic? Like, is it just, do you feel it's just absorbing cinema in your face as much as you can to try and work out camera angles and work out composition or is it something you've learned maybe through other processes that haven't been related to film um i think that's a great question i think uh i think like anything right it's it's constant sort of self-reflection right you you do you do your work you look back on it and you kind of think about you try to look at what's wrong with it or 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 what are you doing that is just habitual right that you, you do it out of habit mm. that you don't even think about it anymore. And so what I, what I, the problem we have as storyboard artists is that 99% of what we draw is out of our heads, right? Like when you talk to regular, when you talk to re- regular illustrators, when you talk to illustrators, they talk <laughs> about, they talk about reference all the time, right? Get your reference, get photo reference, you know, cause that's how you're going to learn stuff. We don't have that luxury. Like I get, I get reference mm. on, what costumes look like or here's some locations or whatever, but you know, we have to do such a vast amount of drawings in a short time. We constantly draw out of your head mm. and you start to rely on these little tricks that you do. Right. So if you read the script and it's, you know, it's a, it's a medium close up on a guy in a chair and whatever, you, you will just automatically start to draw that. And what you have to train yourself mm. is you have to train yourself to go, but does it need to look like that? Like, can I, can I, can I, can I skew the camera? Can I put him a little off center? Can I have something in the, mm-hmm. and these are just subtle touches, but all of a sudden the panel goes from mm-hmm. looking like that's exactly what they asked for in, in the script to, Oh, that looks like a scene from the movie. Right. Cause if you watch a movie, right. you know, all movies are different. There's a lot of incidental elements that happen, right? Like our eyes are, are focused on things the director wants us to see. But it's those other things in the panel 
that can just make things feel a little richer or again, depending on the movie, whatever the movie is, a little scarier, a little more romantic, a little more suspenseful. Um, so I try to, I try to think of things in, in, in sort of that way, right? Like, should I overlap things, right? If I have two people talking and it's an over the shoulder, you know, can I get away with a slight uncomfortable um, overlay? You know, maybe part of the person's, you know, I'm just giving you an example, right? You, you, if you, if yes. I was doing a, if I was doing a two shot over somebody, you would typically draw one person's head in the back of the other person's head, right? But, and right. that's right. Yeah. But just say you did this a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Like just, I'm just, I'm making stuff yeah. up on the fly here, right? But when you start yeah, to, yeah. when you start to put those into a board, you start to get a feeling. And there may be, there may be films or scripture working on that, 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 that doesn't work. It's not, it's not the right tone or manner, right? But, um, yeah. But I just try to I just try to think of don't always because we're drawing out of our head don't always go to those first things that come into your head, right? Because they're they just become reactionary and they can be your best friend when there's no time left on the clock and they can be your worst enemy when you want to try and deliver something you know that that looks fantastic. So I don't know if that answered the question, but like, yeah. yeah, and of course yeah. Yeah. looking yeah. at film yeah. and looking at everything and just and looking at life. Right. I mean, this is all pretty typical stuff, but, you know, how do people interact? How do people talk to each other? You know, what does somebody look like putting something in the trunk of their car? You know, you just, you, you know, because yeah. we have to draw that shit, right? Like everything I draw isn't like amazing. Like it's not some guy flying through the air, mm -hmm. kicking another guy in the head. Right. Sometimes it's somebody getting a fork mm -hmm. out of a kitchen drawer. Right. And, you know, what does that look like? Like, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you could draw it in stick figure form. And it's perfect. But if you can, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, if you can emote something or, or it looks real or it feels grounded, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I, I just think yeah. I just think it makes everybody feel better about, you know, what you're working on. And it makes our jobs more fun, for sure. Right? Challenging. Yeah. I've got a question from some some students, if that's okay, some some young students. And it's the kind of thing that uh, when they're presented sure. with a script, Dan. And how do you deal with maybe drawing a blank yeah. temporarily? A, a couple of people have asked that one as well. How do you how do you come up with ideas from words? Essentially, that's that would be their question. Yeah. Um, what what I do is you you look at you look at whatever you're trying to break down the scene, and what are what are the what are the main beats of the scene, right? Right. So you know the people you know interact. This thing happens, this thing happens, and this thing happens, right? And again, it's like a gesture drawing, right? You know, torso, head, mm -hmm. you know, legs, arms, flow. And then I start thinking about, like, filling in those spaces, right? So, okay, i got to get this person from, from walking in the room to confronting this person. So how would they do it? Are they pissed off? So maybe it'll be direct. Okay, so I'll drop those frames of him being direct. So, But if you get those few beats, it's like, again, it's like doing a piece of finished illustration. If you get down the essentials, then you can start to come back and feed in, um, feed in those details. Because I think what happens a lot of times, especially with young people, they go, they read, they read the scene, and they start with drawing one. They go, first drawing is this, second drawing is this, and you don't know where you're going, right? Because you don't have that map yet. But if you can put in like four or five key beats to get you to the end of the scene, you know where the road is now, right? And the, and the best thing, part about that is once you, you know, keep the map metaphor going, once you complete the map, you can look at it and go, hey, there's a detour over here. Like maybe, maybe I could try this at this moment, right? And that's, that's what's really fun about our job. And I, I pitch stuff all the time and they go, nah, that's, that sucks or that's no good or whatever. But, but like you said, put those, put, put those mileposts up and then start acting mm -hmm. and filling in. And, um, and I would tell your students to get up uh -huh. and act it out. Right. Cause like, I don't read very well. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible reader. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so the words become very abstract for me. So if I, if I get up and, you know, even in a basic way, just kind of start to act out what's happening or read out loud and I do voices, right? Like I will uh -huh. literally, I was just working <laughs> on, I, I was just finishing, I was working on a game a fighting game right now. And if you walked in my studio, I had every evil voice you <laughs> could imagine.
but it, it helps me to start to see the scene in my head, right? Rather than, again, because I'm not a good reader, I just see the words. Right. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it becomes very aesthetic. Like I'm just looking at the words on the page. But if I act it out and I read it out loud, um, you, you start to give it urgency or you start mm-hmm. to give it a, a place in your mind. Like you start to build that scene because you're, you, you've lived it, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one of my little tricks to uh-huh. get through it. Is that um, is that also in the, the part of that? Just just dive into what Russell was talking about with just breaking out scenes. Do you find that there's a heavy distinction between dialogue intense scenes versus action scenes? Are those easier, harder to 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 draw? Out? Um, I mean, physically, like you know, drawing action scenes usually means that there's you know anatomy can be challenging because you know the camera can be anywhere, especially these days, right? Um, or there's vehicles or, you know, whatever, you know, creatures or spaceships Mm -hmm. or space Marines or anything like that. Um, action scenes are a little, there's a little more to consider because they're expensive. Right. So, you know, you have to start deciding, I mean, again, going back to what we originally talked about, the beauty of storyboards is you can, you can do a whole lot with not spending a lot of money. They'll decide what they can do. Right. Like I just worked on a piece just this week where we had this really great, fight scene and then we started to have to compress mm-hmm. it just for money we we'll go okay let's leave out that part yeah. and leave out that edit so um dialogue scenes um you know there, it's it's typically pretty straightforward shooting right um mm-hmm. but what i like about that is is almost like what we're talking about is like how do how do, how you know some directors will tell you exactly what you want i should i should probably point that out sometimes there's directors who are very very cse like, this is what I want. But there's a, most right. directors will kind of cut you loose, right? Um, and yeah. so, like, I, I kind of read it and I go, how do I, if I'm, if I'm looking at this scene, if I'm the viewer, you know, how do, how do I want, mm-hmm. how do I want to see this scene? Do I want to feel like I'm part of it? Do I want to feel like it's voyeuristic, right? You know, do, you know, do I need mm-hmm. to establish uh, the environment all the time? You know, can I slowly through the scene move in? Like, it's all about how, how do I want to feel? And that comes back to kind of acting it out and, and, and kind of, kind of feeling like where, if I, if I was listening in on this conversation, where would I want to be? You know, where, do I want to create right. tension? Yeah. Do I, are, are there, are there two people collaborating or are they pulling apart? Um, you know, I remember I, I did this piece years ago on, uh, it was on, uh, never happened, but it was on, um, story of Anne Frank and, and in the beginning, okay. I framed everything really wide because they they weren't in hiding, right? And 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 they were right. all all conversations because not a lot of action, you know, except you know, sadly near the end. Mm-hmm. But but so in the beginning, I framed every conversation with a lot of space around, right? A lot of freedom, so to speak. And then as as mm-hmm. as they went up into the attic to hide from the Nazis, I started shooting where like I was shooting through a doorway, through a doorway, through a doorway, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah. one of the people in the conversation would be cropped. And I, I, I just started wanting the, the viewer, even though people are again, just talking, I want them to start feeling that repression or that, that closeness. So, so, so there's two sides of it, right? Like, you know, like there's yeah. the emotional side of it. And then like with action, mm-hmm. it's the freaking action side of it. How much money time can we spend? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that must be interesting as well because I mean that's been announced now. But you got to work on the Uncharted film mm-hmm. with Tom Holland, um, which has just been announced. And again, with that, because the games are in a similar vein, a very good balance of yeah. talking and shooting, right? So that would have been a good example. Like with that scene, like Uncharted probably would have had a good mix of, of both, right? Because there's the heavy action scenes, but there's a lot of dialogue, probably similar to a lot of what happened in stuff like Indiana Jones back in the day, right? Like a lot of that. Yeah, kind of like stuff. typically, typically, uh, whenever you do an action movie, they'll get us going on the on the action right away because that takes the most planning. That's mm-hmm. that's the you know the, the there's a lot to think about with that, right? So. Like I yeah. like, it's not uncommon for me to get pulled in on a movie, and they'll go, "I want to give you like the third act, and we, we got to work on right. this because there's a million guys waiting to go." Right? Previous guys are chomping at the bit, and mm. and and so um, typically later on, once you've kind of got that through, they'll throw maybe a dialogue scene at you, or a driving scene at you, or something that's less important that doesn't take that amount of manpower right. and brains to sort of to sort of put it together. So like on, on Uncharted. 
Um, worked a lot on just big action stuff, as you can imagine. You know, and I mean that film went through some three directors, right? So, um, right. so, so yeah, 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 yeah. I know yeah. it's all. I know it's. Yeah, I, I think they said. Have they set a release date for that yet? No, nothing. I think nothing official yet. I think it's still all just kind of it's been announced and it's coming out. But then again, that might even transition into another question that I'll throw out again before I get I get Russell back in. But uh, we were just thought, we were both kind of wanting to ask, but you know, Uncharted is a really good example because you I never knew you worked on the games yes. originally as yeah. well. So was that a completely different prospect? Was it all storyboarding, or do you feel like there is a different connect with games versus movies? Um, yeah, I think there's. I think there's. Um... I, th- you know, there's, I think there's a difference between games and movies, and I think there's also a difference between where you where you kind of are in your career, as well, right? Um, yeah. So, for example, with Uncharted, the game, what was really lovely about that is I got brought onto a, a franchise that I, I liked already and I understood. I love the game, and mm-hmm. um, I think it was on Uncharted three, the opening scene. Uh, Amy said to me, she goes she just handed me the script and she goes, I want you to direct this. I want you to get the characters from A to B. Amy Hennig is one of my heroes, by the way, just a quick introduction. I love love (laughs) Amy. I I was doing some stuff with... Big Legacy of Game Fun. Yeah, I was doing some stuff with Amy just a few months back. Um, And smart, oh my God. And just generous and just a super kind person. Um, And she just cut me Mm -hmm. loose on it. And... um, and and I think I think with games I'm getting more and more of that. Even a lot of games have tremendous directors, but I'm finding that mm-hmm. in this kind of time that we're living in, where there's games and there's streaming and there's movies and people are people are there's lots of cross pollination now, right? Like people from film are going to games and people from games are going to streaming stuff. That that there's this yeah. there's just way more collaboration. Like I would say the last two gaming pieces I worked on, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like this, but you felt like a co-director. Like they were really willing to sort of see your ideas and how you, and how you put things together. And the directors there were, were, were there to kind of keep you on course or there to make sure if you hadn't missed anything. And, um, and then with movies, it can, it can be the same way. Um, I worked with, uh, I worked on a, a Netflix film called Project Power. With, uh, uh, oh, yeah, with, these, yeah. with two directors, Ralph and Henry. Michael B. Jordan's yeah, stuff. Yeah. Who are great. And we literally just sat there, like we're right now, we just keep the Zoom open for mm-hmm. like five hours and just come up with cool shit. Like just, like just go like, you know, it'd be really cool if this happened. Mm-hmm. And so I yeah. just feel like, you know, I'm at that point now and the industry's at that point now where, where people are really willing to collaborate. Like I, I just, I, I don't feel that, yeah. that sort of that hierarchy anymore. And, and, you know, and like I said, Amy's right. a great example. Amy just wants to hire the best people, mm. right. <laughs> and get the best yeah. out of them. Right. So, yeah. 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 Dan, do you uh, ever get the opportunity? Yeah, this is another question from, I think it's from Twitter this time. Mm. Do you ever get the opportunity to play any of the games that you've worked on and on your crazy schedule? Um, yeah, I, I, funny enough, I still, I still like games a lot and, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I do often, I get sent ones that I work on. I'm a real single player story driven kind of game guy. Oh my God, um, me too. Can I just say, I just interject by the way, that one of my lifelong heroes in gaming is Hideo yeah. Kojima and the fact you got to work yeah. on Death Stranding was, oh my God. Yeah, that game for me is yeah. I, I like I like to kind of you know without over romanticizing it. I like to curl up with a good game. You know what I mean? Like I like to oh, sit yeah. on the couch and kind of kind of think about what's going on in the game and and you know look at all the work that they the 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 game devs have done right and you know not just not yeah. just aesthetically but you know like the choices they've made and and um and I'm also yeah. a person who will play a game twice. Because the second time yeah. through, I, I feel like I understand what they were saying, right? Like I, I, or I yeah. understand how they want me to play or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of that's kind of that's the kind of games I, I like I like to play. And, and it's weird to say that 
when I get tired of staring at my screen all day, it's really nice to mm-hmm. go stare at a screen. Um, I think we're all doing that. But yeah, yeah I, I, do, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, Russell, I mean, I know in between storyboarding and doing other projects, Russell's an Overwatch much, fan. Yeah. He's usually that is like uh, way over my head. That, I can just not yeah. that, that has that. been my COVID over over a year now. It's just getting better at Overwatch, basically, kind of thing. You know, reward myself for if I do what I have to do drawing wise. Yeah. Yeah. I did a, like a graphic novel type comic thing. And once I'd done the pages that I had to do, uh, and this right. cycle, I would, I would play, play over. I'm still playing Overwatch, essentially. But I do like things like uh, sort of Half-Life and Deus Ex and uh, yeah, yeah. Dishonored. Dishonored is one of my favorites, you know what I mean? For that that style, that kind of story-driven kind of RPG. Yeah. You know what I mean? However they describe it's, it, yeah. really. You know? So what would be your dream projects? Have you got any dream projects that you haven't worked on? Yeah. <laughs> I just watched the... Oh, yeah. Um, again, I've been, I've been super lucky. Um, I've come to this realization. I just ended up doing a bunch of work for, um, blur for love, death and robots. Um, oh, cool. so yeah, I yeah. saw when I saw the first season, I just went, okay, this is super cool. Right. And I knew Tim Miller at the time, but I didn't, I didn't know this was coming up. Right? Lucky you. <laughs> and, um, so all of a sudden, so love, death and robots volume one's a big hit. So, you know, they get asked to, mm-hmm. to produce a couple more. So, you know, so Tim asked me to work with him and David Fincher on, I, th- I think I did like three, three episodes. So one is in, is in this volume that's out now, two will be in the third volume. And I don't Great. think I've had so much fun and learned so much um, mm-hmm. working on a short film. Like I always, you know, how like, there are yeah. people who make shorts and a lot of young film students, a lot of people, they make these short films and you think it's just some sort of stepping stone or whatever into doing feature length films. I can't tell you how right. enjoyable it was to work on where you're just focused on the story, where you're just focused yeah. on, um, I don't know if you've seen volume two of love, death and robots yet. Oh, okay, not yet. But, not, not yet. No, I've seen the first one. Yeah. I'm a fan of the first one. But the, the one I worked on with Tim, it was like, it was like just deal, every shot was composed, right? Because the, the, uh, it's, right. well, it's out now. So it's, it's for the final episode called, um, the drowned giant. And it's a beautiful piece of writing. It's I've a heard beautiful of that piece one. of writing. Yeah. Right? Heard of that. And Tim just did a beautiful job of, of portraying that writing visually. And I've never worked right. on something where it was, where it was like that. Like normally it's, like we're talking, it's action, it's this and it's that. How are we going to do it? And can, this was like, how can we, how can we get this melancholy sort of story across and make people think above and beyond what you're showing on screen? And I think for me, yeah. I would just love to keep to keep doing that. Like films, films can get yeah. grindy. Um, games can sometimes get grindy um, because you yeah. jump in and out of them. Not saying that I don't. I, I don't love working on them, but boy, when you work on a short, you just feel like it's, you just, you kind of feel like you're in it. Right. And you can always, doesn't matter where you're standing in the story. You can see where you've been, you know, like I know sometimes mm. if I'm working on a big feature, I'll get to a scene and I'll go, Oh shit. Who's Steve? Crap. You know, and I'll flip through the thing. And, <laughs> All right. He's the guy with the thing. And I yeah. forgot, you know, but in mm. a short there, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's just a, it's just on one plate, you know? So, um, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. I I I'm really easy to please. I like I just I, I like just working with it doesn't have to be a big budget thing. I just I just like working mm-hmm. with people who kind of let me collaborate with them and and are kind people and and you know a little bit childish, you know. I mean like it, it's interesting I think for me specifically. I don't know if Russell will agree, but then when I entered the industry well not professionally but you know started to go into events started meeting people back in 2016 i noticed a real disconnect between the people i was interviewing when i started the podcast and meeting versus how i live my life i mean the way you describe your life dan is very similar to mine's like i don't i mean i read but i don't read like you know religiously i don't really sink myself into books for hours i've been a gamer all my life that's why i wanted to get into games or wanted to go to art and, and do that when i left my job as an engineer to go chase my dream of working in games um 
and yeah, I think that it's always trying to find, I think, people in the industry that emulate not only their success you want to see, but the lifestyle they have. And I always found whenever, because we, we had a laugh, me and Russell talking about some concept artists we've, we've met, you know, guys we've talked to in, in games, how they've talked about, you know, they work in these games, you know, like Assassin's Creed and other things like that, but they never play them. They're not actually right, gamers right. per se, they're just artists, which yeah. is fine. But then me and Russell still love games and still love experiencing those things and yeah. you yourself. So it's just refreshing to hear that that's still part of your yeah, life. Yeah, if I now. could, uh, you know, if I could say anything, I'm kind of like hope for the everyday guy, you know, like I'm not exceptional at anything. I'm not... um Right. You know, where, you know, if, if I got time to go spend outside or with my family or watching some bullshit pizza of drivel on TV or I'll do it. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not a, a, mm-hmm. a, a sort of high quality, you know, well-read, um, what's the latest software kind of guy. I, you know, I can never depict myself right. that way. I'm passionate about what I do and I, I work really hard at it. Um, I think if I have any quality, it's my ability to, to see what I do wrong. Um, but you know, I, there's other stuff I like outside, outside of this stuff. You know, I got a cool wife and my kids are great. And, um, my lawn's looking mm-hmm. shitty right now. So I got to apologize for that, but I'll get that, I'll get that <laughs> up and running. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people see the internet and they feel like the, the guys that, who are at the top of the game, they just work 24 hours a day. And there's not much room mm. for people. Um, there's not much room for um, just ridiculous fun. Um, and I don't know if that's true or not, because I've, I've over my years, I've gone to a lot of workshops and stuff. And most of the guys are, we're all insecure idiots, you know. Um, you know, the personas that come on online can be a little bit, you know, veiled, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I One thing... I, I always try to, anytime I do a talk, especially if I get up here in Canada, I'll go and talk at some of the universities and stuff. And the biggest piece of feedback as I get from the students is that, wow, it's great to hear that somebody had like you had a shitty day or struggled or almost got thrown out of college or, you know, you know what I mean? Cause everyone yeah. else seems like they had these freaking mm-hmm. charmed lives. Right. And, um, you know, yeah. I'm here to spite myself. So, if I can do it, anyone can. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just on the the subject of software, I know Russell, you had a question about maybe yeah, Dan's just like a basic and, thing, Dan, and that's stuff. the sort of question that comes up a lot. You you're kind of set up as well. Do you also like do you also sketch on paper? Do you sketch on stuff when you're out and about and things and cafes and things like that? And you know, just with a pen or something. I don't know. I'm just um. A, a, a little bit, um, you know. I, you know, I'm not a, a sort of a cafe mm-hmm. kind of guy. Um, I'll, t- I'll tend to sketch on my iPad. Um, um, I do like sketching mm-hmm. digitally uh, a lot. Um, so I do come down to the studio when I'm not working, and I do draw for myself. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and when I was younger, I, you know, I, I had more sketchbooks, uh, and I probably should do it more, but I'm not embarrassed to say I don't. You know, because because that would be a lie if I if I told you I sketched mm-hmm. all the time. Um, but knock on wood, yeah. like work's been really busy, right? Like like this whole pandemic has been mm-hmm. weirdly busy. Because um, I think in the beginning, a lot of people thought they could just go through with pre production, right? And and we had a little bit yeah, extra yeah. time. So there's times where you know I don't want to drop. You know, like I I I, mm-hmm. I yeah I want to go and play a video game or like I said I want to go out mm-hmm. and you know whatever you know I got a little place up north with a canoe and you know that kind of stuff right um um you know but then are you are you pushing out storyboards specifically on stuff like procreate or are you using photoshop i am uh, or... i am the unicorn out there i use i use corel painter um yeah okay, wow. um yeah. because i still believe for me it has the best brush engine in the game um it is it has problems okay. But once you've been married for a long time, you know how to you know how to get around those those issues. And every every iteration gets better. I just I just love the way it feels. Um, yeah, so I work on a desktop unit. Um, I'm not. A, I love my iPad, but I cannot stand 
file management on iOS. It just makes me want to mm-hmm. put a gun to my head. Um, so, and I like real estate. Like I use three screens, right? So I work on a big Cintiq. And then, you know, I keep my script on one screen and my locations on another screen and something of inspiration. And when you're storyboarding, you have, you have, you have a lot of things to look at, or you should be looking at. So, um, so I draw, I draw in painter, right. Which is the same thing as drawing Photoshop. I just, I just think it feels, I just think it feels yeah. better. Um, I'll use, um, basic, like I'll use SketchUp for stuff. Um, just because of that freaking massive free library they have on SketchUp. And so it's just nice to, oh, I need a Black Hawk helicopter, right? You know, just get on there and kind of position around. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what I do my stuff in. And then there's a piece of free software called Storyboarder, um, that I don't draw in, but it's fantastic for putting your boards together because it's dynamic. You have to edit your frames. Everything shifts, right? Like your frame numbering, your descriptions, your dialogue. Um, and if I'm delivering, uh, a storyboard, I'll use that, save it as a PDF, but most clients now want just single frames. Like they just want just, cause they're going to cut them into a board matic or they're going to edit them themselves. So, so yeah, it's, that's right. pretty much basically my, my, my software it's still about drawing out of your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 The base stuff. Yeah. Is that, or is that also a thing you're doing as well? You find, do you go into uh, animatics as well as storyboarding. Do you kind of do both, or is it spe- specifically just um, storyboards? Sometimes we will will flesh something out. I'm not. I don't get really close to the previous guys. Like I know a lot of the guys I know who work, work uh, on Marvel. Like they'll do these elaborate mm-hmm. sort of animatics uh, for action scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done some of that. Um, I don't. I don't mm-hmm. love it 100. Um, percent Right. That could be because I'm lazy. Um, I still like that that working out the story thing. I'd rather work out story than action. And I don't mind right. working on action at all. Like you know, for anyone listening, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are listening. less less the moment. Yeah, like the the big keyframes, less the moment to moment yeah, stuff. Yeah, really. Yeah, like I like moment. I just like, and I mean, there's sometimes where you will break something down in 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 iteration, right? Like. Uh, I was talking to another storyboard artist and we were looking at a board and it was up a staircase and a character was coming down the staircase. And this guy was a younger guy. And he said, how come there's so many frames of this guy coming down the staircase as opposed to let's have a frame of him at the top frame of him at the bottom frame of him leaving frame. But what he, what he didn't see was that the character was, there was a lot of trepidation, right? This character was coming down the stairs and he was frightened. So yeah, that's where you maybe want to do it in six frames where you get the idea that he's really creeping down the stairs, right? Rather than I just need him to get from A to B so production can kind of see this, right? So there's sometimes where, yeah, you'll do more of a, a flow to a piece of action, right? Um, and then there's sometimes where you can be a little bit broader with your storyboards because you just you just don't need all those in-betweens, right? Yeah. Yeah, is that even just to jump into Russell? Because I mean, you've been doing stuff, uh, pre-production Look, for films, films and the moment, projects. Uh, what you've been, uh, like you've been doing as well. Is, is there yeah. something specifically you're finding sorry, that's a struggle? Sorry, in... movies, eh? Yeah, but is there, is there anything you? No, no, no. I was I was just going to say, is there anything particularly you're finding that you're stuck with yourself as an artist? Is there something maybe that you would want to post to Dan as something that you maybe come up with? Well, what would you? What would be your advice to? to young artists that like to get into boarding, Dan, really? That would be my question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question, you know, aside from, you know, having samples, right. Which is always difficult to do mm-hmm. stuff for yourself, but, um, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, learn, learn the language, learn the industry, but also don't be afraid to, when I, I remember when I first started storyboarding, and this was in the advertising days, there was kind of this thing that your portfolio had to have. You needed some car stuff, got to get some food stuff, right? Do some stuff with kids, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's bag looked the same, right? I tell now Mm -hmm. people is, you know, have, have some core stuff, but also give me a good section of who you are, right? Like, like I, like I was just saying earlier, I finally, the industry now is, is so receptive to bring on people for just their creativity. 
right? Um, mm-hmm. So have those core tenets that you need as a storyboard artist. Do an action thing. You know, give me just let me know that you understand the language of film. But then put something in there that just wows me. Something I haven't seen, and 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 it's your directorial style. Um, something that you know that's a little bit you're a little bit passionate about. Um, I, I think that I think that's really really important these days, right? I think that's what can kind of separate you or. Or, or, you know, people can go like, okay, it's not just a wrist, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, right. I mean, I know a lot of what we do is very wrist-like, you know? Like, you know, I, I, I mm-hmm. hope I'm not making yeah. it sound like I'm, I'm, I'm some creative force, <laughs> right? You know, it's, I still got to, you know, the director still has final say in everything, right? But, um, yeah, but yeah. you know, I'm a legend in my own mind, right? Um, but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think, I think it's really important for for people now to understand that, you know, that you, 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 you have some ideas and that you're a creative, you're a creative person. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah. And I also think a sense of, I don't know how you portray this, a sense of confidence in problem solving. Like what I, what I tell, what I tell yeah. a lot of students is like 50% of it is what we draw and what we do. And the other 50% is removing all the problems that producers face. Right. So I want a yeah. producer to phone me, this is how I know I'm doing a good job. A producer will call me and go, mm. when you work on a film or a game, here's the director. We all do a virtual handshake. And for the first week, the producer's on the emails. And when I see the producer's name goes off the email, I know they're happy with me because they go, Dan's, right. Dan's got this. I got like 100, 100 problems yeah. over here to solve, right? So if you can, yeah. if you can, if you can problem solve, if you can, you know, deliver on time, be polite, know how to write a proper email, um, own up when you fuck up, right? Because I still do, right? And then make that correction fast. Man, that's all free. It doesn't cost you anything to provide those services, but it will take you far mm-hmm. in the industry, you know? Um, yeah. You know, I think, I think those are a lot of things that students forget about is just how to conduct themselves. Yeah. You know, whether they're shy or whether they're bombastic or whether they're just young and idiotic, because I was, um, if you can temper all that and just and just learn those sides, that's 50 percent of your your product right there. Right. Is is, you know, the three of us mm-hmm. looking at each other. Right. And how we communicate. Yeah. Is that something you'd also advise, Dan, is uh, sitting with films specifically, maybe and taking, you know, pausing, grabbing a frame copying it down is that also something you were doing early on or something that people would probably you'd advise people to do early on or? yeah i would i would say yeah look at film and um i i i see a lot of people will do f- like frame studies they go yeah i paused a frame from this movie and i did the study and that's fantastic mm-hmm. and but what i would always try to to tell somebody is make sure you understood what happened before and after it right so don't get just caught up in like right. freezing a frame you know, and, um, mm-hmm. you know, Cone brother frame and going, oh, yeah, here's how there's the lens and here, what, whatever. Expand what you're going to learn from that study. Like, instead of maybe just right. doing a frame, do the sequence, right? So I'll go like, you know, yeah. they come in and they do whatever. And then you'll start to understand what really builds that story rather than what the, what the, the cinematographer, the DOP had in mind with that one shot, you know, you know, um, yeah. Because I find a lot of people do do frame studies, and I'll do them sometimes. And it's an exercise in drawing, and it's an exercise in copying aesthetically what they see on screen, rather than you're actually copying something that was moving, right? So you should really yeah. think about the you know the point A, the point B, right? Um, I, yeah. I think that's yeah. I've tried to do that before. I was going to say, I've just tried to do that before. I've done that recently. Just, I've never posted it, but I took uh, a Jackie Chan fight scene, one of his old school scenes, for, and, and done the one of his whole fights, which is obviously sometimes are five, six minutes long, but tried to do as much as I could. But yeah, like the movement. And then for that, I've done something like the the throne room battle and like, uh, the, it was at Last Jedi, you know, at the end when they're Kylo Ren yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. fighting together, like trying to frame you know, that. Just, so, like a whole I sequence. It's like a really said. interesting exercise. I've never really done it before. So you watch a scene mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. just draw out the blocking, like an overhead version of like, you mm-hmm. know, wherever the scene takes place and where the characters move to and where the cameras are at. Right. So you're not getting caught oh, up yeah. with trying to draw really well. 
um, you're actually mm. you're actually analyzing it like 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 a like a map, right? You go like, oh, this is really interesting. The camera was here when this character entered, and these characters rushed over here, and then for the next shot, we pushed the camera up close and low to this. I think that'd be a really good. I think that'd be a really good exercise, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because camera the camera angle shots the pan the tilt so, like they're all things that will be vocabulary things you'll need within uh your work so so yeah, it's yeah, good to yeah. Like if so you I can start to just work. break down what those shots are right and and not mm-hmm. worry about whether you can draw them when I mean, they, they look accurate but just mm-hmm. just how how the director went through this scene um i think mm-hmm. i think that'd be a, i think that'd be a great i'm gonna do that <laughs> it's funny it's probably you know what? it's probably a little bit harder than you think uh-huh. i'd love to see let's... you know yeah yeah Russell, you, I can, I can yeah, see your thinking just there. Exactly like what you mentioned, and I'd love to be able to. And you've probably done it at workshops and, and conferences and things like that, where we get to see uh, when you're presented with a, a bit of script and how you might process that, how you might go into it. You know, what I mean, in, in sort of real time as well. That would be that would be fantastic to see. You know, how you would deal with the kind of I don't know if you're gathering some some reference and things like that. You know, just to sort of see how you how you work really. You know. You know, you know what I find really interesting is that, um, and again, this, you know, it's not, I didn't come up with this. I've heard this before. Sometimes some of the best ideas I have happen when I just go for a walk or get away from it, right? Because you're, you're right. so tied into what you're looking at, right? And like, I don't know how many times I'll do this. I'll draw something, delete it, and then draw the exact same thing again, only to delete it and draw the exact mm-hmm. same thing again, right? So sometimes if you're just looking at something, you're, you're, you're bouncing around, but if I'll, I'll go off and, and I like to go for walks or runs and all of a sudden you just see things differently, right? Cause your adrenaline is kind of running and your, the horizon line is way out in front of you. And all of a sudden you'll, you'll go like, Oh yeah, I could do this. That's, you know, like you'll just, you come up with that solution that you were looking for. So I think sometimes it's not a bad idea just to get away from everything. Right. And, and just kind of distract yourself. Um, I don't know how, I don't know how the human brain works, but like you can kind of think about things and do other things. Like I can talk on the phone and draw mm-hmm. at the same time. I don't know. I don't know why I can do that. Like I could probably draw a storyboard frame right. as we're talking, but I can't read mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. any noise on it. Like if I have to read something, I can't have music in the background. I can't have another human near me. So um, I think our brain has a really interesting way of, of, of sort of working together. And I think that kind of stimulation outside of what you're actually drawing, uh, lets your imagination start to run, right? Because your, your eyes aren't focused on those, mm-hmm. those drawings you have in front of you. So, um, yeah, I work pretty, to answer your question, I work really organically. It's a, it's a mm-hmm. shit show on screen. You know, mm-hmm. you know, Russell, I, I, I wish I thought it was really beautiful, but, uh, no, if I'm, if I'm it's, it's, the it's just script, all you have to have the, the script end. to know exactly what was going on in those thumbnails. Cause they're so, you know I mean, they're so rough kind of thing. And sometimes it's cool to share that sort of thing, just for people to see exactly how rough your initial ideas can be. You know, and I don't think people like it. You tend to lose a few followers with that kind of thing, but it's all part of it. And I think that's where all of the, the creativity is. You know what I mean? It's all in that, that kind of initial phase, because as time goes on, uh, things get more and more kind of fixed or more nailed down or the, the costumes get established and things like that. So I think that's where, you know I mean? And you're back to kind of maybe your your gesture uh, uh, mentioned as well, Dan. You know what I mean? Like gesture yeah. through the sequence or, you know I mean? Taking some of your life drawing type thing, type approach and getting it into your, into your frames and things like that. I thought that was really interesting, you know, uh, I'll see if I've got any more questions at the moment. You know? Yeah, I think, I think anyone who wants to get into wants to get into storyboarding, they have to they have to realize that you're going to have to you're going to have to check your ego a little bit as far as doing aesthetically beautiful things, right? And, and you're going to have to understand what your function is, um, and and just take solace in that, right? You know, in our in our weird little shadowy world we live in. Um, uh, I, I think that's, I think that's, you know, like you said, I think that's the hardest thing for people to understand is that when they look at your thumbnails, they go, Oh, Dan's not mm-hmm. so great or Russ, mm-hmm. those aren't amazing. 
right? They're not as good as this or that, but that's not what it is, what we're doing. It's not where we're, you know, it's so weird that our, you know, this, you know, I want to get too high on our horse here, but it's so weird that our little sketches mm -hmm. are probably more important than the, the, mm -hmm. the beautiful concept pieces, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Because they are literally the blueprint I think, I think also for everybody looks at your storyboards, every single person. Yeah, I think it's also because so many games, like we talked about earlier, are story yeah. driven, and how do you convey a story without action, without you know hours and and Maya and ZBrush and building those scenes? Everything starts yeah. with the board, yeah. right? That's that's your base level stuff. So, um, I think there's 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 so many unsung heroes in the entertainment yeah. industry, uh, not just boarders, but VFX guys as well, and and whatever else you know. But yeah, I think boards definitely play uh, uh an almost like etching on the wall in prehistoric times like you're conveying a mood you're conveying an atmosphere you're conveying uh moving images without words and i think that's why boards are uh are one of the biggest unsung heroes because it can like he says it's, it's one of the most important and, and beginning aspects i remember so. i remember like 15 years ago somebody was talking to me somebody's interviewing me and they go so you know <clears throat> he didn't say it in this sort of cruel fashion but it goes like, like i guess your time's almost over because the previous guys are going to put you out of business. And 15 years later, the first mm. guys on my email list who want boards are the previous guys. Like they're, they're chomping at yeah. the bit to see your boards, right? Because what are you going to previous? Yeah. In fact, a movie I worked on, they, we, they added a little action scene at the end and directors called me up right away and they said, can you storyboard this out? The previous guys did it, but the execs hate it. Because you know what initial previs looks like. It looks like a video game from 1985, <laughs> right, yeah. right? And I just drew a yeah. storyboard, but again, but again, you know, it's not, I'm not talking about my drawings in particular, but a sketch and a drawing emotes. There's there's a human mm -hmm. kinetic energy to it. And it sold the whole scene. Yeah. It sold not that the previous guys were bad yeah. or not talented or whatever, but again, you know what a previous scene looks mm -hmm. like. Right, it it, it just looks. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. Even if they put sound and music to it, it just doesn't feel the same as when you see drawings mm -hmm. and you. Yeah, I don't know. It's just there's something you know. There's it's like holding the book in your hand or having the book on your screen. There's just something about when when you can tell a human being has done it. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting for me. I was going to just say quickly. I mean, Russell will probably have something to say in this as well. But for me, storyboards and comics almost seem like the same entity. They almost seem like they, they, they exist in the same space to an extent, um, because comics obviously are also narration as well as action. But they seem like frame by frame, panel by panel. I mean, obviously, they're not the standard, you know, sixteen by nine. But you know, a lot of comic stuff mm -hmm. will, will will overlap. I think with with the quite a lot the, of the stuff you get within we'll storyboarding as well. Do you feel this the same? Yeah. Yeah. That quite in depth about the kind of framing and things like that, and and the, the way the page is designed, and it's yeah, there are I say there are kind of relationships between between the two, but I think it's it's a wee bit like maybe uh, lyrics and poetry. You know, I mean, they're, they're they're quite related, but they're they're not the same as well. I was talk I was talking about that today with my right with my partner yeah. kind of thing, just about the sort of storyboard thing and the, the comic thing as well. I'd say mm -hmm. I'd say the comic thing is is much more mm -hmm. in general terms uh, developed. You know, I mean, you are getting into somewhere maybe closer to illustration or something like that. Just depends depends on the on the comic, I suppose, and mm -hmm. it depends on the boards as well. Right. Have you done any sort of comic type stuff, Dan? Yeah. No, I, I, I have nothing but respect for people who do it because I know I can't. That's how I always mm. gauge things. Like when I just go, I can't do that. Um, and I, and I agree with you. There's, um, you know, there's an aesthetic to comics where you are meant to pour over an image, right? In storyboarding. Right that the image you're looking at is, is just a, it's just a catalyst to get to the next image. Right. And it is right. different. Like, I mean, you know, in a sense I worked, I worked with Zack Snyder on 300 and on Watchmen. And I remember when we were in a Watchmen, he, he, and I, I just read Watchmen. I'd never read it. And mm -hmm. we were talking about the script and he was going, you, you have to adapt the script because 
there's certain things in a graphic novel that you can only do in a graphic novel. He goes, he goes like, I can't make mm -hmm. this graphic novel into a film, right? Because there's elements or there's context or there's just the way you go through a graphic novel that doesn't happen in a mm -hmm. film, right? And I remember right. when, when we did 300, um, you know, uh, Zach, Zach's idea wasn't the story of 300. It was, it was Frank Miller's story of 300. So a lot, when I was right. storyboarding it, almost every scene started with Frank's panel. Like we, we aped all kinds of Frank's compositions and everything for that. And mm -hmm. Zach came up with that. You know how the, you know how the fight scenes are like, they ramp them up and down, they mm -hmm. go slow and then they go fast. That was all because that's the way you look at a comic. It wasn't just so it looked cool. Right. Like, you remember you open that splash page. There's like, you know, five guys kill each other. Mm -hmm. You just pour over it. That was, that yeah. film is kind of like this homage to like a graphic novel. Like the, the best way you could take a graphic novel and make it into, into sort of a film. Right. And that's even why it has that kind of aesthetic. Yeah. Right. It looks very kind of two dimensional, you know? So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to, I don't have, I don't have a lot of background in, in, in comics. It just mm -hmm. looks really, really hard. Yeah, it goes against my short yeah. attention span. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think with your level of drawing at the moment, you definitely could pull it off. I wouldn't say you would struggle so far as maybe just the the layout, but like your illustration skills probably would be, I, uh, you know, good good enough to 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 put together a story. I, I hate so, to say yeah. this, but there's an element of storyboarding, and I may get in trouble for saying this, but there's an element of the good enough factor. There's times we just gotta let it go, mm. right? Because because there's yeah. everything else is more important, right? Um, yeah. and there's times where I kind of can just let stuff go. Like, you know, that part's not drawn well, or that could be better or whatever, but in the context of the scene, yeah. it works fantastic. And I think in comics, yeah. you just don't have that luxury, right? Cause people are going to pour over those panels and there's that composition right on. And is there, is there a proper continuity yeah. from, from character to character to image to image? And to me, that, that just seems overwhelming. Right, so yeah, I got nothing yeah. but respect for guys who do that. It's that also. I mean, I know early on when you worked on Uncharted, you done some almost it was a character kind of concept designs or some stuff for yeah. early on. Was, was is there a reason that you didn't also do some or have you done concept as well or is is it something else you maybe wanted to focus on but boards were were better for yeah, you? Yeah, I, I, I don't consider myself a concept artist but there are times where I do concepts because we're ahead of that, that crew. Right. So I'll get a script right. and those assets haven't been designed yet. Right. Um, right. like I'll go, Hey, so what does this look like? And they'll go, we don't know yet. So right. I'll do something, you know, within the ballpark and I'll show them and they'll go, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great to get us through to the next phase. Um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. concept art has, has evolved so, so much that, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I, I couldn't compete in that world. And honestly, I, I don't know if I'd be that interested mm -hmm. in producing art in that fashion. Mm -hmm. I still like this, mm -hmm. what we're doing here, this conversation and sketching stuff out and right. working on it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I get my fair okay. bit of, um, I, I, I'd almost call it like sort of loose key art, you know, just, to, okay. cause, cause again, a lot of times when movies start to happen, they get us out in front first, right? They, they want to start seeing boards because right. they, they can start budgeting, right? Um, right. And, um, and yeah, there's times where they don't know what stuff is, you know? Yeah, you're doing a kind of sort of early Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Like I was, I was working on, uh, I just worked, finished working on a game and we'd be in the meetings mm -hmm. and um, they would go, okay, so then this character comes in and the, the director would go, do we have the character yet? And everybody on the Zoom call goes, no, we don't have it yet. And they go, okay, we'll send yeah. you something that you can, you know, kind of loosely base it on, right? Um, because the concept right. stuff's really important too, right? They can't rush that either, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, but um, so I'm I'm happy to do those kind of kind of paintings and, and loose stuff just to get everybody a visual to hang something off of, right? right. But um, yeah, sometimes I'll do some character stuff, but I like storyboarding. I think that's my that's my jam. 
Yeah, yeah excellent. Uh, one of the yeah. things I enjoy most and kind of looking at your work, Dan, is things like the the we get a sense of the quantity of iteration in what you're doing, where it feels like you've maybe, certainly with your thumbnails, you've actually been through very many more thumbnails at the and the ones that you share are the ones that are kind of cool to like maybe okay to share as well in terms of, you know, uh, is that the case? Do you do you have a high a high turnover of of iteration of ideas and drawing and redrawing and things like that? Yeah, I tend to I tend to draw when I first started. I um I would draw in a very particular way where I would I would do my sketch. And this is we're talking digital here, right? I would push that sketch into the background, put a new layer on, tighten it up. And now I just work back and forth. Like I just, I just sort of cut and chisel and draw back. That's why stuff has a particular energy to it because um, I feel like, I feel like I'm better at sculpting than mm -hmm. I am at drawing. And uh, I typically try to use drawing tools that are really cumbersome. And um, because I'm not very detail oriented and my anatomy can be a bit dodgy. If I use something that's very precise, um, I'm not a good surgeon, so if I use a brick to draw with, I feel like I kind of get what I need to get um, with a, a with a sort of a kinetic energy and aesthetic that I like. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see my frames, there's a lot of pushing and pulling that goes on in there. Like I, I like I just I just literally keep my finger on because we work mostly in black and white initially. I just I just go back between black and white, black and white. Like I just go back and draw and back and draw. And I, you know, I think, I think I, it was one of those things where you just played up your weakness and made it your strength, mm -hmm. right? Instead of trying to be, you know, for years, I tried to be like other artists and try to produce boards that look like, you know, the guys that I, I idolize. And I just, I just realized it was spinning my wheels. And so I, I think there's a, a quality to my boards that some people like because there's that, like you said, you can feel that iteration. You can feel that, that kind of back and forth that kind of goes in, you know, through, through the front. And I'm not embarrassed mm -hmm. to show that, you know, um, it works for me. <clears throat> Was that the same when you worked with, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to use an obscure example if I can, but like when you worked with Kinjima, was that, were you directly working with him? Was he, was there kind of like a translator involved? How did that process work out? That was maybe differently? Or did that yeah, come through third, a third party? That's third party. That came through like a, like a US right. agency and, and you're, you're right. working with them. Yeah, I wish I could give you some amazing story about that. Um, and that particular job mm -hmm. was, I mean, that thing was all nailed right down, right? And you know what the hard yeah. part about that job was? Excuse my language. Like, mm -hmm. we're looking at stuff going, what the fuck is this game about? <laughs> like, like, if you, like, yeah, remember, like, you've never played it or anything, right? You'd, you'd, and yeah, yeah. you're just, you're, you know, like you, when you work on a project, you like to kind of understand the, the, the source material, right? You know, what's the motivation? You go like, yeah, yeah. so he's a courier. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. and this is coming like, this is probably coming from like, from, the studio in Japan through their agents in mm -hmm. Japan through a studio in the U S up to me. So by the time we got to right. me, like now that I look at the boards, they're actually not bad considering if you, if you knew what yeah, was yeah. going on in my head, like, like, like you're just going like, I don't do, I don't get this. I know we know it's Kojima. <laughs> we know it's so weird. Right. But, but a lot of yeah, game yeah. companies still use, um, they still use like marketing agencies, right? Like a lot of the stuff you see, doesn't come internally, mm -hmm. right? They they they, right. they interface with like a, a marketing firm, um, and then the marketing firm may interface with a production studio, right? So sometimes sometimes there's right. a big chain between 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 what you're mm -hmm. doing, like the, the 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 developer, the marketing guys, the mm -hmm. the production company, those directors. Um, like I often read, like I, I do a lot of trailers, and I'll mm -hmm. often read where. In, you know, I'll watch it on YouTube and you read the comments and they'll go like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, such and such studio make the best trailers, man. And I go, I, I didn't mm -hmm. think that. <laughs> usually, it's usually, <laughs> you know, somebody else, right? It's like Fuller or somebody else. Makes yeah. It, right? It's not the game. Yeah. Well, that was a, that was a big thing a while back with, with Suicide Squad because eventually it came out that 
one of the guys that cut the trailer, I think the second trailer for Suicide Squad, ended up recutting the film because the trailer yeah. was so popular. I thought to myself, who made that decision and why? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that must have been a last minute effort. But because uh, that's why I brought up like the the Death Stranding thing, because I wondered, you know, Russell was talking about iteration. I was wondering, you know, what's your iteration capacity on something like maybe a short trailer like that that's maybe come through a third party versus actually working my games company. It gets you know? it gets really interesting because you you run that um, that fine line between the developer wanting to put all their cool stuff in it. And mm-hmm. they understand what the hardcore fan wants to see or needs, right? If you know, if this is a game that's mm-hmm. an iteration, or whatever. And then you have that thing, but is it going to be entertaining? Is it going to is it going to tell a story, yeah. right? Um, mm-hmm. And be, it becomes that real kind of that kind of fight between less is more, right? Um, mm-hmm. you know, like you can get so far into the weeds with all the cool stuff they've been working on for three years and they want to allude mm-hmm. to it or hint at it or do this, or you can't forget about this storyline or that storyline. You're trying to put something into two or three minutes. It's brutally hard. Yeah. And usually the best trailers, yeah. and you know, this is from a guy who just storyboards and I don't direct them are the ones where mm-hmm. at the end of three minutes you go, holy shit, that was awesome and it's usually a, a linear idea like you see that new one for diablo mm-hmm. oh my god yeah four yeah yeah, yeah I think, amazing uh, yeah. right and it's just it's just a story yeah. and it's the three guys and the thing yeah. and here's the thing and you know it doesn't take you in a million mm-hmm. places or, or, or whatever so um i i you know I, I mean i used to learn that in advertising right like because i worked with ad agencies right they'd have the product or the service or whatever they're trying to advertise. But the client wants, like I used to do a ton of car advertising, right? And we right. do something about the car and here's the demographic who's going to buy it. And it's a feel good car, but mm. Toyota wants you to see the new catalytic converter or they want to see the new stylized right. headlight or it's really important because they right. just redid the, and, and I think that can happen with game trailers. Sometimes the developer it just really wants to show off that stuff but i guess i guess you got to decide what your market is yeah. you know i think it's also blurring the lines between film and games because i mean i know talking to my friends i have a blizzard who work in overwatch you know when they talked about making their cinematics for the overwatch it was almost like they were making pixar shorts you know they were trying to make small condensed animations that were conveying heroes but obviously were more studio oriented there was less gameplay um and i think that's where games are kind of going now like even with Death Stranding I mean it was definitely even the trailer like that you worked on it was less gameplay it was more just trying to show off the journey yeah. the story um yeah, so yeah, I guess yeah, I guess I in the that's, end that's you know you have to decide and I mean it's not uncommon for them to to put out a lot of content right some stuff that's kind of gameplay yeah. other stuff that's story oriented um I don't think I don't yeah. think that's a bad idea at least you know from my my perspective you know but I but I typically yeah. get brought in on um like because they do a lot of work with blur they do a lot of uh cinematics uh, a lot of trailers and stuff and um it's really interesting to go through that process with them to to sort of see Mm -hmm. you know what's going to make a good trailer and i think now gamers are sophisticated enough to know that a trailer's a trailer you know like you know Mm -hmm. i don't think gamers feel like they're being tricked anymore you know know, yeah you know they, they they know like look at league of legends right Look at, look at the amount of the amount mm-hmm. of content that League puts out, and then go watch the game oh, yeah. play. You know, like they have this whole yeah. freaking Ridiculous. other world of amazing content, and videos, and and whatever. And then when you watch the game, to yeah. me, it's super disappointing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, even though the the expanded universe, you know, they're doing animated shorts and they're getting TV series yeah. built up and. I know some friends at Airship who are working on uh, the Rune King game. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely a lot of content. Yeah, yeah, there, but they're so, smart, right? Yeah. Like they, 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 and I, and then, and the players are, the gamers are smart now because they understand that there's this whole lore and this whole world, and it doesn't all have to mm-hmm. be fit into the game, right? The game is the game is just mm-hmm. ground zero yeah. for all that stuff for them to to get get excited about and, and be part of, part of their world, yeah. but. You know, back in the back in the day, remember where like remember the old um was that like Killzone Two trailer when that one came out, everybody just flipped out because oh, it was yeah, amazing. 
and yeah, the ch- the chill that was yeah, in your chill yeah, that was like it was like, even play, it was the cinematic. Look yeah. like. and I don't I don't think people think that anymore. I think people understand they're looking at a trailer and they want to get excited about the story, yeah. and and yeah. you know people are sophisticated enough to understand that. Uh, Russell, uh, any kind of closing well, questions uh, or last things you want to in ask? In terms of maybe conducting yourself as a, a self-employed artist, what would be your advice there, Dan? How do you, what would you say is good, like communication, that kind of thing? Uh, it, it seems like you possibly deliver on time most of the time, within within you know, within reason. So. Always, mm-hmm. always. Yeah, I would tell people because um, I've always been freelance um, to to seek out um, you know sort of professional advice outside of your knowledge base. So get yourself a good lawyer, get yourself good accountants, um, pay your taxes on time, um, do all that 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 shitty stuff that is going to. As my dad taught me, it's it's the, your head on the pillow stuff makes you sleep well at night. Um, and then just be a good person to work with, you know, just be thankful that, um, that, you know, we, we, we get to do what we love to do and it's not always, you know, roses, right. It can be really difficult. And, and I've had difficult times in my career and, and, um, and those are the moments that I learned the most or, or, or they're the ones that stick with you. But, um, just like, just, just be thankful you're doing it and just try to approach everything really optimistically. And like I was saying, all, all 50% of what we do is you can just add that in, just be a good guy and follow up on jobs and see how people are doing. And, and like I said, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know I, I, I refer to my parents a lot cause they, they raised me, but remember, you know, my dad telling me, you know, a person's character isn't how they are when they're right. It's what they do when they're wrong, you know? And uh, yeah. I'm the first guy who will phone a client and go, holy shit, I, I fucked up. I missed this. I forgot to deliver that, I, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And as soon as you do that, yeah. it's amazing the tension goes away, right? Like yeah. I've even taken a bullet when I know that the, that person's wrong, like they didn't tell me about mm-hmm. something. But instead of arguing with them, mm-hmm. I just want to fix it. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you go, Hey Dan, you didn't, yeah. you didn't do that scene, man. And we got, we need it by four. And instead of saying, well, you didn't tell me about it. I'll go, Holy mm-hmm. shit. Okay. I'll, let me mm-hmm. get it done. And you just feel, mm-hmm. you just feel the pressure and you just feel everything kind of, kind of go down. And I'm not saying that you should be a doormat either. Like trust me, there's times mm-hmm. where you gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta stick up for yourself. But, but I think, um, mm-hmm. but I think the, Again, the more you can solve people's problems with with your personality, your attitude, and, and how you approach things, um, man, it's just it's, it's going to take you. It's going to take you farther. You know, that's that would be my yeah. my sort you of. You answered all of my questions. Done. Good two cents. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, awesome. They were great questions. They were great questions. Classic, yeah. <laughs> I have questions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Definitely, we we'll, we'll, are. Uh, yeah, definitely. We'll try and get you maybe back on again, Dan, at, at one point when you've got another sure. another gap and uh, we can get more questions or maybe even like uh, Russell was suggesting, because I have done that with some artists on the podcast. We've done 90 minute challenges where we give them a brief and then uh, they, yeah, yeah, they yeah. work through it as quick yeah. as they can and see what we get at the end. But yeah, yeah, it could be a project yeah. for, for later well, down the line. That I mean, I, mean I, should, I, should, I, should, I should thank you guys because, you know, we, we storyboard ours kind of dwell like I said, in the shadows and, and, um, it's, it's always pretty unusual when somebody wants to talk to us. Um, um, so, so thanks a lot. Thank thanks a lot for just shining a little bit of light on, on what we do. Yeah. Really amazing. Yeah. Really, really, really yeah. Really thank you for coming on. It's an honor. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're the first, you're the first storyboard artist on the podcast. There's always first with this yeah. podcast and, but plenty of concept, plenty of 3D and stuff. And then the last time we had Billy on, we had a UI artist oh, on, cool. so yeah. uh, you're the first yeah, story yeah, of an yeah, artist. Yeah. No, so, great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, try uh, try and expand, try to, but then it's funny, somebody talked to me about it the other night saying that, you know, Gordon, you're probably one of three people who has an art-focused podcast, and if you disappeared, there would only be two. And there's millions of us that want to get on and talk. Yeah. So um, it kind of made me a bit more positive about the thing no, I do I, here. I think, so I think, I think what you do it. is great, and... 
I think that the, one of the biggest things we struggle with as artists is that, that conversation we have in our head, right? Because your mm-hmm. thoughts bounce around and most of the time it's never good, mm-hmm. right? It always just kind of ends up destroying yeah. you. Um, but when you get to do this, mm-hmm. right? When I get to speak to you guys yeah. and you find out mm-hmm. that we're all humans and, and yeah. I don't know, it just everything. Oh, you play video games and you yeah, love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything just yeah. feels possible again, you know? Um, yeah. A rip. A yeah, yeah. well, not a rip. The, the, you're not just stuck in your head, bouncing around, right? Trying to guess things, right? Yeah. Like, I, I know, and I'll, yeah. I'll, you know, we, we can end this off, but one of the first workshops I ever went to, mm. I remember meeting some of the, the, the people who I idolized. It was thrilled mm-hmm. to hear how insecure they were how just real they mm. were, you know, because you built them up yes. in your mind as these infallible gods, right? And yeah. you finally realize they're just, they're just, they're just like you. And, and instead of being intimidated, you were inspired, right? Because, because yes. you, you, they're your brethren, right? Like, you know, we're, we're all these, yeah. like right here, we're three guys who are insane enough to make a living <laughs> doing art. And if we didn't have each other, who would we have, yeah. right? Precise. I know. Yeah. That's it. Brother, brothers, brothers in arms. Brothers <laughs> That's in right. Trenches. That's right. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course, man. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Just, just lastly, to just to say thanks to, to to Dan for coming on, giving up his time. I know he's busy. Um, and of course Russell as well who's you know in between projects he's, he's Thank you. obviously got a schedule as well. So thanks to you both for coming on and talking. It was great and. Um, yeah, definitely hope we can we can get you both back at one point. Um, if you guys have stuck about to this point and you've listened, uh, thank you very much from the three of us. Uh, I hope you found it informative and I hope you have uh, plenty of questions for both Dan and Russell. Uh, if you want to leave them down in the, the comments, uh, you can obviously find us through iTunes, Spotify, um, Google Podcasts and stuff like that. But we are also mainly on YouTube where you'll find the video version of this where we've talked. And uh, yeah, if you want to leave any comments or questions, I'll make sure I'll leave both Russell and Dan's links below so you can find their work or reach out to them if you want. I'm sure they'll both be happy to, to answer questions if you, if you guys have any. And uh, yeah, we'll try and get them back on at one point and, and maybe go through some more. But uh, but yeah, thanks to thanks you guys for listening. Thanks to uh, Russell and Dan for coming on and uh, we'll catch you guys in the next, the next episode. Bye. Bye, guys.